Now it's time to do a little, little figure in here. Oh. So welcome back everyone. It's a very chilly Sunday morning on the homestead and we are going to get the sawmill prepped for a new timber framing project that's going to come up. We're going to pick out the logs, get everything set, got to get the battery charged and do a couple little minor repairs on it. So we're going to go back to the, uh, don't, we're, we'll be going back to the uh, common man's tool kit, but we'll be alternating between back and forth, you know, depending on the weather. When it starts raining or the weather's really inclement, then we'll get, we'll go back in the shop and work on that. But I can't waste a day like today and I just couldn't, I couldn't bear it. So let's get started and we'll take you along with the repairs and the little maintenance things we got to do. We'll pick out our logs. I got a pretty Doug fir set up over there. I'll show you the cut sheet and hopefully we'll be cutting some timber today. So before we fire up the Lucas mill, I'm gonna I want to take the battery out and I'll take it we'll take it over to the shop, get that charged up. Um, I drained the fuel. Uh, we'll put fresh fuel in it. Do a quick oil change. And I broke. I was just setting things up over there and I broke one of the lift chains. And then we'll go fix that as well. We'll uh, put a charge on this here. I'll just slow charge for an hour or so. And then we'll uh, we'll go down there and take a look, see if we'll select the right log. Should do it there. Let's go 120 minutes on 12, 2 amp. Yeah. Man, this light is murder for videoing. Okay, so the good folks at Lucas give you this nice toolbox with... All kinds of cool stuff in there. Spare parts, different things you're going to need. Here's the sharpener. And and um, I contacted Nick, my buddy Nick at Bailey's and said I needed a new link. Could you get one to me? And he's like, you already got one, man. It's in the toolbox. And sure enough. There it is. So we'll, uh, let's cut this out of here and I'll show you. We, but I, I broke a link and we can repair this here real quickly. I ran into a guy the other day. They're at the part store. I don't know where we were at. I can't remember. It's been a month or two. Anyway, he needed a pocket knife or something. He's like, anyone got a knife or anything to cut this with? I pulled one out of my pocket and he was shocked. He's like, you carry a knife in your pocket? Man, what what's this world coming to? I have to tell you the story sometime of why my granddad always carried a knife. Yeah, his pocket knife saved his life. So this chain here... Is the chain that's used to raise the carriage up and down for setting the uh, you know your depth of your cut, and it's um, they use this. It's heavy. It's not a motorcycle chain, but it's not a bike chain either. It's kind of right in between. It's a pretty good chain. This is a master link, and so it broke right here. You see, it hooks on right there. So here's a there's a replacement in there. So let's see if we can't. See if we can't get this off here without jabbing a screwdriver into my finger. You know, when you get older and wiser, you still do stupid things, but the difference is, is you, is you can anticipate what's about to happen to you. If that's any consolation or not. Maybe I put a glow. I just, I have this bad feeling because I'm, I got this screwdriver that I've sharpened into a chisel for little jobs like this, and it has. Well, it's bit me more than times than I'd like to admit that should just come you know this is had it maybe we can spread that oh, grief that thing is really giving me a, some trouble should just, let's do something a little blunter well, snap on won't let us down there how about we use our brain there instead of brute force Okay, that chain is an amazing invention, isn't it? It's all these things we take for granted. That sheared right there, you can see it. So this is the adjuster on here. I'll, I'll need to take the, uh, I'll need to adjust this longer so I can get the link on, but we'll have to put it back. So I want to keep track how many quarter, how many quarter turns we do here. Okay, friends, that was 40 quarter turns. Don't let me forget that. We'll 
put our new master link on here. Yeah, that's pretty simple. That's the thing I noticed with this mill, is it's not overly complicated. It's, you know, it just reflects the Australian personality, you know, keeping things simple and usable and not a lot of nonsense. And a guy can fix that in the field nice and easy. I mean, I could even go down, to, I bet I could even go down to the parts store and find these. So that chain we just repaired, that is how the winch raises the, the rails down, which adjusts the thickness, how thick of a timber we're going to cut. So that was a pretty simple fix there. So while we're waiting for the battery to charge, we can start taking a look at what logs we want to use. These logs, majority of them are going to be used for, uh, for firewood. But uh, we've got some really great ones. Um, there's kind of a mix here of, of Douglas fir, which makes the best timber framing elements, and Grand fir, which makes the worst. We're not going to use those, but there's more, should be more Doug here than Grand. It's kind of hard to tell. I can tell some of these, it's got a different color to it. I apologize for the light. There's a couple things here. So I'm looking at this one here. I can tell very easily that this is a Grand fir because their branches grow at a perfect star, kind of a star pattern, not perfect, but pretty uniform. When you look at one, you can see it has that very traditional, looks like a giant Christmas tree. The needles are very similar, a little bit heavier and shinier, but sometimes they're hard to tell, but the wood is very much lighter. It's, it's almost a white, a light yellow, but I can see that right there and tell that's a grand fir. That's not one, that, we don't want to use that for timber framing. Here on the other hand, we've got a, this one here is, this is the small end of a 40 footer, probably about uh, 12, 13 inches there and it tapers up fatter. Look how nice and straight that is. Oh, it's a little dark in here. That is a beautiful saw log right there. Do we have a lot of limbs and knots? You know, that's something we want to consider. Each one of those limbs and knots, they don't make for a strong log. They're basically a hole in the wood. Um, so we want to see that, you know, of course, up here on the smaller end, boy, that is so dark. On the smaller end, there's going to be more limbs. And down here on the lower end, man, this is the cream right here. This is the good stuff, the base of the log. Now, is this a Doug fir or is it a Grand fir? I'm not quite sure yet, but we can tell. We'll take a saw and we'll cut a little round off there. I'll be able to see the fresh shavings and be able to smell it. They have both have a very distinctive smell and tell exactly what that is. But if that's a if that's a, a Douglas, that's gonna be that's gonna be a log for us. So today we'll be using the uh, the Husqvarna Husqvarna Carpenter's axe. This is an axe that I haven't really warmed up to yet, and I think it's primarily because it's it's intended to do carpentry work, to do timber framing, log construction. And it has that's the role for it. It has it does it's not a great axe for just general chopping and such. So we'll be putting that to the test today. I'll tell you the story why Granddad always carried a pocket knife. So he he saw to it when I was just little. I mean I wasn't very big when he gave me my first pocket knife. He gave me a charade old timer, the three blade with the sheep foot on it. You know you know the old classic one. That's what that's the one that he always carried. And he said that he, when he was younger, grew up in Oklahoma, they had uh, got their land from the Oklahoma land rush. They'd lived in a self-sufficient homestead there. 40 acres or 80 acres, I don't remember. Anyway, he was out there somewhere. And he crossed a fence, he was crossing a pasture, and there was a mean cow bull with, with horns uh, that came after him right when he was in the middle of the field. He said he took off running and the thing chased him down before he could get to the fence and was mauling him, mauling him to death and he was you know, fight, fighting for his life. Mean cows, they're, they're nothing, they're dangerous. Many a man's been killed by one of those things. So the, <laughs> or this bull I guess, I, I'm not a farmer, I don't know all the terminology, I think it was a bull. Uh, so he, he was fighting for his life and, and trying to get that out of, you know, trying to uh, 
you know, s protect himself, and he was able to get his pocket knife. He had just a little pocket knife out of his pocket and get, get it opened up, and he started cutting on that on that bull's nose as it was as it was uh, yeah, goring him. And uh, finally, he cut his nose open enough with that little blade that that it turned off and let him loose. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he uh, he got out of there, got back over the fence. But that that's why he always carried a pocket knife. That's not really why I always carry one, but I I just think it's handy. But I was, I never forget that. So I've got I've got taken a lot of flack from the way I start my saw, and I, I do owe an apology. The drop start method is um, kind of a a cowboy. Um, I just the way I always done it, and I don't think about it. But I've been reminded by so many people. Uh, including still in the comments uh, that uh, they'd like to see me not do it that way. It sets a bad, bad example. So uh, I, I'm, a, uh, I have, I'm a certified saw, uh, faller with the Forest Service and they teach two ways. Um, you can, the preferred method I think from still is to put your foot in here like that and start it on the ground. But the Forest Service, they okay uh, this method of just putting it between your legs like this, making sure that the chain brakes engaged and, and starting it. I'll let that saw warm up a little bit. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll just cut a little bit off of that and then we'll take a look at the, at the chain and smell it and see what kind of the tree we have. And if that's a grand bird, then we'll have to pick something else out. got here oops looks like it's pretty light no I think that's a dug yeah I think that is a Douglas fur what well, sure looks light to me does that look light to you a little bit of checking started right there now this is good, so this this tree here is big enough that we can uh, we can cut our timbers free of heart. Now the heart is the center of the tree right here, and this is something that I'm I, I've been reading a lot about. I, I, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to how you cut timbers out of the board and or out of a log, and where you cut them, and the it can determine what they'll do when they dry. And how they check, and so of course the best stuff is what you you know if you had had your choice you would cut everything free of heart, meaning that there's there's no heart in there, um, or you can cut you know box heart which which would have you know small on the smaller ones where you cut it like that where where the heart is in the center and those are you know they're going to change dry and change differently so you know I'm really important structural elements on timber framing. For example, a corner post where you have a whole bunch of joinery coming in together into one place, you'd want to cut your best stuff. You'd want to cut your stuff here on the furthest extremity on the outside of the growth rings. It's going to it's going to be it's going to move less. It's going to be more stable, and things that are not so important like floor joists and things you can, you know, free you can cut with a hard or boxed hard in there. But uh, this is a this is a nice. This is a nice one here. I think this is our log, guys. I think this will do it. Boy, I just want to be sure I, I can't, I still have that cold I've been fighting off. I can't smell very well, but I think. Yeah, that's gotta be Doug fur. That does not smell, because uh, the grand fur, it, it stinks. It's stinky wood. That's That smells good. It smells like proper wood.
So I got the log jug out here. Uh, got it supported by the tractor there so we can cut it. I guess it's time to reveal to you what you got, what we're gonna build. This is something you guys can be able to build yourself. You don't almost, need almost no tools. You don't need any of this stuff. You can go to, go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you can get six by sixes and four by sixes and build the same thing as I'm building. I'm building full dimension, meaning mine are full width, but you can do the same thing. You just, you know, just scale everything down just a little bit uh, with just regular lumber store lumber. It's gonna be a proper set of, can you see that? Of timber frame saw horses. I've never had a set and I have a bigger project, but I wanna have these out here so I have a nice stable area to work on. The little saw ponies that I used were, were just fine working in the, on the concrete. But I don't wanna work in that gloomy shop. I, when it's, I wanna, it's inspiring, I wanna work out here. And uh, to do that, we're gonna need these saw horses. So let's, uh, let me bring you up close here. We'll take a look at them and we'll go over our cut sheet and we'll see uh, what we're gonna need for timbers. The sun, I'm sorry, is just horrid. It's early in the morning and the sun's coming up and it's just, Oh, it's terrible for camera. Okay, so this is a set of um, this is pretty much a standard set of timber framing, basically plans or you know blueprints you might call it back in the day. Um, and uh, you can get these for free. Um, I found this website Timber Frame Headquarters, and if what they do is they sell uh, plans for all different types of structures, cabins and different things. Um, and if you just create a free account, they'll give you this set for free. So I was looking at some of the other things and I, I might buy one of their sets of plans. The set of plans for like a cabin is like 50 or $60, but they're, they're really, if they're anything like this, they're really well done. But you can get these for free. I'll just download them and print them out. So we'll start right here as so we have the timber list uh, for the horses and it gives you the exact um, timbers that you need right there. It shows right there that we have four, that's the quantity. And, and which, which piece that is, these are the posts, and it's four by four by three. So when we see that, we see we three, three, six, 12 feet, 12 feet for these por par this portion right here of the four by four. And here we have two of the brackets, four by fours as well. And so there's another six. So we have 12, so it's 18 feet of four by fours there, right? I'm doing math on camera, very dangerous. Very dangerous. Okay, down here, we've got uh, the bases, four again. Now these are four by sixes and 1.8 uh, feet. So, and there's quantity four, so we can figure that out. So that's how you can, you know, right off the bat, you get an idea of what you need to buy for material. And then from there, it's pretty simple. It has a breakdown of the pieces. And really, you know, we have duplicates here, but um, there's only four, really four individual pieces on this. Can you see that? Man, it's so gla glare is so bad. These here are the same, this is one element. These two here are the same, that's two elements. These are the same, that's three elements. And these four are the same, that's four elements. So there's four elements to this. And then on page three, we can see, now we get down to the, to the cut sheets where the exact dimensions are. Very simple, easy to follow, and a great little set of plans. So that's what we'll be working off of. So we'll go back to the first page and we'll see, so you'll have, have to figure out what we're gonna need and how much can we get out of that beautiful Doug Fur saw log there? 